Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of Medisodes. And this week, we're going to be discussing the problem with antibiotics. To many, antibiotics are the wonder drug, the magic bullet that has helped drop global deaths from infectious bacterial diseases to levels where, in most modernized nations, they're no longer a major threat. However, antibiotics are slowly becoming less and less effective, and the crisis of antibiotic resistance is one that is just around the corner for humanity. Today, we're going to be discussing the problem with antibiotics and what solutions there may be to the crisis. So let's begin with, what are antibiotics? In a world where humans face the threat of disease caused by bacteria on an almost daily basis, antibiotics form the backbone of a lot of medical institutions around the world and their way for dealing with bacterial infections. The word antibiotic comes from the Greek words anti, meaning against, and bios, meaning life. Literally, they are against life. However, antibiotics are actually effective against only one form of life, that being bacteria. Antibiotics are broadly used to refer to any substance that is used against bacteria to kill it. However, there are two technical subgroups. True antibiotics, which are produced naturally by one microorganism fighting another, and non-antibiotic antibacterial substances, such as antiseptics, which are fully synthetic. Antibacterial substances include antiseptic drugs, antibacterial soaps, and chemical disinfectants, whereas antibiotics are an important class of antibacterial substances that are specifically used in medicine and sometimes in livestock feed as well. They are identified in a process that's known as bioprospecting. Despite the wide variety of known antibiotics, less than 1% of antimicrobial agents actually have medical or commercial value. For example, penicillin has a very high therapeutic index as it doesn't affect human cells. However, this is not the case for an other antibiotics. Other antibiotics might also simply lack advantage over currently used antibiotics or just have no practical applications. Through the bias prospecting screening process, Isolates of many different microorganisms are cultured and then tested for production of diffusible products that inhibit the growth of test organisms. Most antibiotics identified in such a screening process are already known and must therefore be disregarded. The remainder are then tested for their selective abilities and their therapeutic traits, and the best candidates are examined and then further modified. Finally, these suitable antibiotics are mass produced on an industrial scale such as by the use of fermentation in large vats on the scale of 100,000 to 150,000 liters. They can also be created synthetically in a lab. However, this can only be done to certain antibiotics, such as the quinolone class. They can also be produced semi-synthetically, where it is produced by a combination of natural fermentation and laboratory modification to maximize the antibiotic's antibacterial efficacy. So how were they discovered? Before the early 20th century, it was only via medicinal folklore that antibiotics were used, mainly derived from mold or plant materials. The ancient Egyptians used moldy bread to treat infected wounds, and Nubian mummies have been shown to have elevated levels of modern antibiotics from the beer they used to produce. However, the use of antibiotics in modern medicine began in the late 1880s, when German chemist Paul Ehrlich developed the field of synthetic antibiotics, which he would later class as a field of chemotherapy. He noted that certain chemical dyes would stain bacterial cells while others did not. He then theorized the creation of chemicals that would bind to bacterial cells, but not human ones. In 1907, he found the first synthetic antibacterial compound called salvarsan, or now called arsphenamine. However, this was not a true antibiotic, but a synthetic antibacterial. The first true antibiotic came in the form of penicillin, discovered in 1929 by Sir Alexander Fleming, who was working on a culture of disease-causing bacteria and then noticed that certain molds killed or prevented the growth of said bacteria. He believed that these antibacterial properties could be exploited for treating humans. After early trials in treating human wounds, collaboration between British pharmaceutical companies ensured that mass production of penicillin was possible. And in the USA, following a fire in Boston where nearly 500 people died, penicillin was tested on these people as they received skin grafts, which are highly liable to infection. This treatment with penicillin was hugely successful, and the US government began supporting the mass production of the drug. By 1944, 
Penicillin was being widely used to treat soldiers in World War II and was nicknamed the wonder drug. Scientists in Oxford were instrumental in developing the mass production process and Howard Florley and Ernest Chain shared the 1945 Nobel Prize in Medicine with Alexander Fleming for their role in creating the first mass produced antibiotic. The discovery of antibiotics grew massively in the post-war era. From 1935 to 1968, 12 new classes of antibiotics were launched, including the penicillins, cephalosporins, the aforementioned tetracyclines, glycopeptides, and the quinolones. However, after this, the number of new classes dropped heavily, with only two new classes introduced between 1969 and 2003, the oxadolidonones in 2000 and the lipopeptides in 2003. This drop in the antibiotic production pipeline, as it is termed by the WHO, is the topic of today's episode. The current weak antibiotic pipeline does not match bacteria's increasing ability to develop resistance, causing this worldwide crisis of antibiotic resistance. But before we get onto how this crisis occurred and its potential solutions, Surya will go over how antibiotics work so we can better understand them. So I'm going to be discussing the types of antibiotics and the mechanisms behind how the different antibiotics work. There are four main mechanisms which antibiotics use to kill bacteria. These are inhibition of the cell wall synthesis, inhibition of protein synthesis, alteration of cell membranes, inhibition of nucleic acid synthesis. Let us look at each one of these mechanisms in more detail and look at the examples of antibiotics that use these mechanisms. First of all, let's look at antibiotics that inhibit cell wall synthesis. There are many antibiotics that use this mechanism to kill bacteria. Beta-lactams antibiotics prevent the synthesis of peptidoglycans, which are important polymers in the bacterial cell wall. The cell wall provides structural support for the bacterial cell, and the presence of peptidoglycans is what allows the cells to divide and multiply. So inhibiting the production of peptidoglycans means that bacterial cells can't divide and this reduces their reproduction and eventually this means the bacterial cell infection is treated. Vancomycin is another type of antibiotic that uses this mechanism by preventing the cross linkage of peptidoglycans. The cross linkage of peptidoglycans is essential in creating and maintaining a strong cell wall. So the lack of a strong cell wall means that there will be a large inflow of water into the bacterial cell and this large increase in osmotic pressure results in the bacterial cell bursting known as osmotic lysis. The next mechanisms to look at is the inhibition of protein synthesis. These antibiotics work by preventing the translation phase of protein synthesis from occurring. This results in a lack of important proteins such as enzymes needed to build the bacterial cell wall Without the required proteins, bacterial cells can't divide and replicate or carry out metabolic processes, and hence inhibition of protein synthesis is an effective way of killing the bacterial cells. There are many antibiotics that use this mechanism as well to kill the bacteria. One example is tetracyclines, which inhibit bacterial protein synthesis by binding to the 30S ribosomal subunit. This blocks the attachment of the tRNA amino acid complex to the ribosome, preventing translation and hence protein synthesis cannot take place. The third mechanism we'll be looking at is the alteration of cell membranes and how this can help to kill bacterial cells. This mechanism works by breaking the structural integrity of cell membranes. Polymycins are antibiotics with a general structure consisting of cyclic peptide with long hydrophobic tails. They disturb the structure of the bacterial cell membranes by interacting with its phospholipids. This breaks the cell membrane structure, affecting the permeability of the cell, and this can make the bacteria more vulnerable to other antibiotics. The next mechanism is the inhibition of nucleic acid synthesis. These work by inhibiting the synthesis of nucleic acids, which include DNA and RNA. Quinolones are a type of bacteria that work by inhibiting the, an enzyme called DR, DRNA gyrase, an enzyme needed for bacterial DNA replication. The inhibition of bacterial DNA replication prevents bacterial reproduction. For example, bactitracin works by inhibiting RNA transcription, preventing protein synthesis from taking place in the bacteria. 
And now on to Adrian, who will be talking about antibiotic resistance. Antibiotics are extremely powerful medicines, and they are, in some cases, the only way of treating certain types of bacterial infections. But with great power comes great responsibility, and the misuse of antibiotics is one of the greatest threats facing modern medicine. Bacteria, just like many living things, have a primary aim to survive and reproduce. When infecting a person, the aim is not to cause harm. Rather, the harm that is caused is a side effect of the bacteria using the body's resources to reproduce and divide. Antibiotics are the main way to kill these bacteria and flush them out of the body. However, bacteria are slowly but surely beginning to build up resistance against antibiotics. And this is a threat to global health, food security and development across the globe. Antibiotic resistance can affect anyone of any age in any country. A growing number of infections such as pneumonia, tuberculosis and salmonella are becoming harder to treat as the antibiotics being used against them are becoming less effective. Antibiotic resistance leads to longer hospital stays, higher medical costs and increased mortality rates. But how are these bacteria becoming more and more resistant to antibiotics? The reason for this increased resistance is present in all organisms, natural selection. A selection pressure is a condition, usually unfavorable, that puts a pressure on the population of an organism for selection to overcome that condition. In this case, antibiotics are an extremely strong selection pressure. There is a strong need for bacteria to evolve to overcome this threat. Bacteria gradually become more and more resistant through gene mutations. Gene mutations are random changes to the DNA base sequence. This change in base sequence often leads to the production of a different protein, but it can also lead to previously inactivated genes being switched on, or vice versa. Or it could mean that the protein chain does not stop being transcribed where it was meant to be, and more amino acids than intended are added to the primary polypeptide structure. In most cases, it may lead to no change. However, mutations can cause a mixture of these changes. Mutations are random and occur spontaneously. Indeed, if a bacteria has a mutation that made it slightly more resistant to antibiotics, then it would have a greater chance of surviving when a patient takes antibiotics. If, after antibiotic treatments, only those with mutations that make them more resistant are left, these bacteria can reproduce. Bacteria reproduce by binary fission, and so daughter cells will have the same genetic information as the parent cells. This means that the proportion of bacteria in a population that has the gene for increased antibiotic resistance will increase. This process happens several times, up to the point where an antibiotic is rendered completely useless against a certain strain of bacteria. This is the process of natural selection, and it happens in all organisms. However, bacteria can reproduce at an alarming rate, and it is this fast rate of reproduction that means that antibiotic resistance is such an imposing threat upon global health now. It takes several generations to develop a certain characteristic in an organism. If the organism in question were something like a tree, then the several generations that are needed to develop a characteristic would span thousands of years. However, bacteria can reproduce much, much faster than trees, doubling in number every four to 20 minutes. What this means is that bacteria can develop resistance to antibiotics very, very quickly. The scope of antibiotic resistance is something that many underestimate. In all parts of the world, antibiotic resistance is rising to dangerously high levels, and new resistance mechanisms are emerging and spreading globally, threatening the ability to treat common infectious diseases. As infections become harder and harder to treat, more antibiotics have to be used to treat them. This could mean stronger doses, a longer course, or both. Indeed, having to use more and more antibiotics only worsens the problem. For those that survive after even more antibiotic exposure will be among the most resistant to antibiotics. The overuse and misuse of antibiotics accelerate the rate at which bacteria develop resistance. Bacteria will develop resistance to antibiotics eventually, but we have to slow it down as much as possible. Sparing use of antibiotics is an effective way of slowing down the rate of antibiotic resistance.
Simply put, the less we use antibiotics, the fewer times a resistant bacteria will be singled out and allowed to reproduce, and the slower that rate at which a bacteria as a whole species develop resistance. In the UK, healthcare professionals have been advised only to administer antibiotics when necessary, in the smallest possible dosage to cure the infection. However, not all countries have strict guidelines regarding antibiotic use. In the UK, antibiotics are only available with a prescription. In other countries, they are available for purchase by the public. This means that in these countries, antibiotics are misused more frequently and more often, sometimes even in cases where they are completely ineffective, such as treating a viral infection. Similarly, in countries without standard treatment guidelines, Antibiotics are often overprescribed by health workers and so overused by the public. There are a few actions that individuals can take to slow the rate of antibiotic resistance development. You should make sure to only use antibiotics when prescribed by a certified healthcare professional and don't ask for antibiotics if they're not recommended for treating your illness. Always make sure to finish the whole course of antibiotics. It's really important. The more resistant strains of bacteria are those that are more likely to be remaining towards the end of the course. So by not finishing your course, you provide these more resistant bacteria a higher chance of survival and ultimately a higher chance of reproducing and passing on the genes for greater resistance on to further generations. Indeed, these measures are ways of slowing down the rate at which bacteria become resistant so that we can develop new antibiotics to take the place of those that have depreciated and become unviable. Now I'll hand over to Shrey, who will be talking about solutions and alternatives to this problem. So obviously, not using antibiotics unless wholly necessary is very important, but this only delays the problem of antibiotic resistance. Ideally, we need to find new treatments, and one of those is phage therapy. So you may be wondering, what are phages? Well, they are the most abundant organism on the planet. There are 10 to the power of 31 bacteriophages on the Earth. And that means there are estimated to be more bacteriophages than every other organism on Earth combined. And they're found wherever there are living things. There are one million just in the human gut. Astonishingly, these tiny viruses, which are little more than DNA in a protein shell, are responsible for the majority of deaths on Earth, wiping out half the global bacterial population every 48 hours. Every species of bacteriophage is highly specialised, targeting only a small group of related bacteria. They're not harmful to human, we counted billions of them every day without even knowing it. When bacteriophages find their prey, they connect their tail fibres to receptors on the bacteria's surface and inject their genetic material into the cell. New bacteria are made using the bacteria through the lytic cycle. Once the bacteria are full of bacteriophages, they lie and die, releasing hundreds of new bacteriophages that repeat the cycle. So let's go over a brief history of bacteriophages. They were discovered in 1917 by a French Canadian called Félix Seherel at the prestigious Pasteur Institute. And that means that they actually are older than antibiotics, which, you, as mentioned, were discovered in 1929. And throughout the 1920s, there were clinical trials for phage therapy for diseases such as cholera and dysentery, and there was some success. But the discovery and commercialization of penicillin, which is easier to mass produce, meant that most Western scientists lost interest in bacteriophages. As a result, most of these developments in this field have come from the former Soviet Union, where due to the Iron Curtain, Western innovations in medicine were limited. The Red Army used phage therapy successfully in field hospitals during the Second World War to treat bacteria infections such as gangrene and dysentery, saving many lives. And during the Cold War period, Soviet scientists continued to refine their phage therapy, although unfortunately these didn't make it across the Iron Curtain. Today, phage therapy is used in Russia and Eastern Europe, and Georgia's George Eliava Institute, founded in 1923, is a leading center into research into bacteriophages. With the growing problem of antibiotic resistance, Western scientists 
began to realize that bacteriophages could be the answer to solving antimicrobial resistance. Let's go over some benefits of using phage therapy. Firstly, they can be used to treat antibiotic resistant bacteria because they use the lytic cycle, and this means that they can kill superbugs. They can even penetrate through some biofilms that the bacteria use to protect themselves, something antibiotics struggle to do. Bacteria can evolve to become resistant to certain bacteriophages, and this is a drawback, but they're not a significant one because of the sheer abundance of bacteriophages and the fact that they can evolve too. There's also been research that, just, that suggests for bacteria to gain resistance to bacteriophages, then they, they must give up some of their antibiotic resistance. So we should be able to treat bacteriophage resistant bacterial infections with our normal chemical antibiotics. Now, I mentioned earlier that they're highly specific, and this means that unlike chemical antibiotics, they only act on a small, narrow range of bacteria. And this also means that they don't affect other cells or gut bacteria that are useful. And this is a major advantage over chemical antibiotics because antibiotics can have some major side effects. Um, for example, many people are allergic to penicillin. And numerous clinical trials have shown they're safe and they have very few adverse effects. However, it's still important to use highly purified samples of bacteriophages in order to make sure that there's no toxic substances such as endotoxins that are mixed in with the bacteriophages. They are also really easy to discover. You can literally just take from sewage and you can find millions and millions of bacteriophages that have never been discovered before. And this low cost is also advantageous because you can find millions and millions to, and then test the ones that are effective. There are some limitations to using phage therapy. The main barrier to the widespread introduction of phage therapy in the Western world is not a lack of scientific knowledge as such, but regulators' reluctance to approve the practice. The main concern is that for phage therapy, therapies to be profitable for pharmaceutical companies, they'd have to be patented. And this poses an ethical question. Can bacteriophages, which are living order organisms, be allowed to be owned by one company is also not very practical as another company could just take that bacteriophage and use it anyway. The bacteriophage can also evolve during production, further complicating patent rights. Alternatively, pharmaceutical companies may be able to patent genetically modified versions of bacteriophages, recipes for phage cocktails, which are mixtures of bacteriophages that are given at the same time, or even make bacteriophages from scratch. These could be uh, would solve some of the regulatory issues, although they would delay the introduction and it would be very expensive. Bacteriophages have been improved by the American FDA and European EMA for use in agriculture to protect food against Listeria, Salmonella, and E. coli. So it's possible that as the evidence mounts for phage therapy, regulators will use the approve the use of the practice. However, their high specificity is also a drawback. It means that you need to be exactly sure which bacteria is causing the infection. And this can take time. And in uh, an emergency situation, you don't have that time. The patient could die. And this is the main problem with phage therapy. Even if you have a cocktail of different phages, they are still act on a much narrower spectrum than even so-called narrow spectrum antibiotics. This means that there will be limited use for them, especially where time is a limiting factor. There's also the public perception of viruses, um, not only the coronavirus, but also other viruses such as HIV, which are also have stigma attached to them. And many people would be very uncomfortable with injecting a virus into themselves, and rightly so, to be honest. But it's important to know that bacteriophages are not like other viruses that cause infection. Although they're viruses, they are helping us, and we need to make sure that this is conveyed to the public. Overall, I believe that phages can be a solution to antibiotic crisis, but I think that they may have to still be used alongside chemical antibiotics to make sure that we still have the emergency response needed.
and antibiotics can become our weapon of last resort, the one where if we can do nothing else, we'll use chemical antibiotics. And phages can be the run over the mill medication that we give to people when they have bacterial infections. So thank you for listening today, guys. Hopefully you're a lot more educated about the problem with antibiotics and why taking them is such a risk nowadays. Of course, if you are prescribed by a practitioner, make sure to complete your full course of antibiotics to get the full effectiveness and to avoid increasing the problem of antibiotic resistance. So thank you for watching today's episode and make sure to like, comment, share and subscribe for more episodes out every week.